Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AWS Nordics Office Hours. My name is Gunnar Grosch, and I am a developer advocate at AWS. Every week on this show, I have AWS, AWS experts on from the Nordics and elsewhere within AWS uh, to talk about a specific topic. And you, our dear viewers, have a chance to listen in, hopefully learn something new, and ask any questions you might have on the topic. And we'll do our best to answer those questions. And this week, well, it's no different. I'm happy to welcome onto the show Specialist Solutions Architect for Databases, Tim Gustafsson. Hello. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. Hey. I'm very happy to so, be here. Tell the viewers a bit about yourself, Tim. Sure. So um, uh, as you say, I'm a specialist architect, uh, solutions architect dealing uh, with databases, primarily open source databases running on AWS, um, also the Aurora offering, which is tied to those open source databases. Um, I actually started on databases like in around 1994. Um, so that'll kind of date me a little bit there. I started on um, MSQL, which is actually kind of a predecessor to MySQL. So I, I don't know if everybody knows about MSQL or not, but um, kind of grew up from that uh, over the last 25-ish years. Um, always kind of been an unofficial DBA, but never really had it in my title. Um, uh, spent a lot of time doing app development and system administration and that kind of stuff. And then um, almost three years ago now, I started working for AWS um, and uh, have moved into a specialist role about a year ago now and uh, have really been actually enjoying it quite a bit. It's, it's kind of where I feel like home uh, to a certain extent. So I guess I have to uh, ask your name, Tim Gustafsson. It sounds oh. really Swedish. You're located in Sweden, but I am. you are not Swedish. Yeah, my father's side of the family came from uh, Kalmar, and his uh, great grandfather uh, emigrated to the US in um, 1871, I think it was, or something like that. Um, and then um, about three years ago, my wife and I, we had a kid and uh, we decided that we wanted to live overseas. And um, we decided we wanted to do that before um, he graduated high school. Uh, so we chose to go when he was still a baby and we've lived here for three years now and we really love it. Um, Sweden is actually a really awesome place and we're very happy to be here. So on to the topic then, Tim, yeah. databases on AWS. And sure. that's a quite big topic to cover. So. First off, um, when we talk about databases on AWS, now there's a lot of talk about moving applications out of relational databases and into NoSQL and different serverless databases. So yeah. should we move everything to NoSQL? We probably shouldn't move everything to NoSQL. I, I think that's one of the most common um, misunderstandings that I hear when talking to folks. There's a lot of perfectly valid workloads for relational databases still. Um, and I think it's a little bit, dis, um, it does us a disservice to kind of think about it in black and white terms like that. There are definitely a lot of uh, database engines that are better suited for certain types of workloads. Um, but it, it's very rare when you have, you know, even a moderately complex workload that everything fits nicely into one paradigm. Um, as I mentioned, I started on databases at what I consider a pretty long time ago now. Um, and so I spent, you know, 20 years, almost 18, 20 years thinking about everything in terms of how would I fit this into a SQL database. Um, the the NoSQL landscape has changed that dramatically. Um, and for a lot of really good reasons, you know, NoSQL offers a lot of advantages that you simply can't have um, in an ACID compliant database. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's the right place for everything. Um, so, you know, if if you're if you're if you're if you're presenting data to users and you're you've got a web application or, or a mobile application or something like that, you know, NoSQL really um, helps with a lot of those kinds of workloads. When you start talking about things that require um, really high levels of transaction isolation, um, really high levels of um, relationships between different tables, um, SQL is still a really good way to go. Um, I would just, you know, one of my sort of standard cautions to folks is don't think about it in terms of should we move to no SQL, or should we stay in SQL? It's it's the answer is probably a little bit of both, um, and some of your workload might be in SQL, and some of it might be in No SQL, um, or in one of the other purpose-built databases that serves specific needs like time series data or cryptographically so secure uh, ledgers and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you touched there on purpose-built databases, and that's a term we hear quite often, and we at AWS use that quite often as well. So, yep. what is a purpose-built database? 
So I, I think probably the easiest way to describe it is to give you a concrete example. Um, probably one of the more popular uh, purpose-built databases that I work with currently um, with customers is the, the time, uh, time stream database on AWS, which is built specifically to ingest time series data. And so if you think about things like IoT sensors or clickstream data or maybe um, data about people coming into and leaving buildings or that kind of stuff, um, that's really well suited for time series. Um, time series data has some really specific properties to it. Um, everything that happens in the last maybe an hour, maybe a week, maybe 90 days um, is really interesting to the application, depending on what the, app cap the application is, that window can be a little bit different. But the data tends to be a lot less useful as it gets older, but it's still important to keep around. And time series handles this problem really nicely by keeping the most recent chunks of data in memory and making them super highly available, super low latency to the applications that need to consume them and also to ingest them. You know, because we're ingesting the transactions into memory instead of into disk, um, we're able to do it much, much more quickly than, than you could if you were committing it to disk. And then the system automatically takes care of taking that older data that's perhaps slightly less interesting and moving it off to magnetic storage. But from the perspective of the application, it's a single view of the data. So when you query your data, you're not having to query two different data sources you query the one data source and the engine takes care of bringing the two together as needed. Um, and so for the vast majority of your queries, they're all happening in memory, they're very, very fast. But when, uh, let's say a customer wants to go in and see their historical activity, um, they're able to still access that historical data without needing to break out into some other system altogether. So that's an example of a purpose-built database for ingesting and consuming time series data. Um, there's, a, there's a handful of other ones out there. QLDB is similar. Um, QLDB stands for Quantum Ledger Database. And if you have a, a, the need to cryptographically verify and secure each transaction along the way, um, QLDB can help you with that kind of stuff. There's also Neptune, which is a graph database. And so this is a, a type of database that's built to map relationships between different entities. Um, the, the common example that people give is like social media where I'm a friend of you and you're a friend of somebody else. And that engine is able to resolve that, that indirect link very, very quickly and very, very efficiently, which would, is actually quite expensive to do in a SQL database. So you as the solutions architect then, are there specific properties you look at when you try to choose which is the right uh, database engine or database service to use? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of, one of the most critical things to look at when someone starts asking questions like that is what is the access pattern? How is the data being consumed? Um, if the data is being consumed in a, in a way where it's being written in and then read out in kind of key value store, you know, NoSQL makes a lot of sense. Um, if you're able to architect your schema in a way that you can uh, retrieve data from a NoSQL database very efficiently, then yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, if you're doing, you know, um, uh, a lot of relational stuff, a lot of analytics type stuff, light analytics workloads, then a relational database like MySQL or Postgres makes perfect sense or Oracle or MS SQL, whatever. But on the other hand, if you're doing more large scale analytics and you're really just kind of, um, crunching numbers at a super huge level, then you might move into something like Redshift, which is actually built for that kind of aggregate function type analytics. Um, and, and that engine in particular is really built for, you know, terabytes or petabytes of data. Um, you know, I, 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 there's not really like a, like a hard fast rule, um, but if you've got, let's say less than 50 terabytes of data, it pr you probably can analyze it in a regular SQL database without a whole lot of pain. Once you get past like the 50 terabyte mark, again, depending on the schema and the use case, you know, then you start to look towards data warehouse, things like Redshift, um, possibly Athena, um, where you're actually reading the data directly from S3. So that, that's the kind of older data that you're analyzing still, but is very static um, and doesn't change very much. And you're okay with the queries having a slightly higher latency um, because it has to be read from S3 instead of from an in-memory index or something like that. So, I mean, how you're using the data is probably the primary um, question, the very first one that you want to ask. Um, and then other factors start to come in, like the velocity of the data. How often does new data come in? How often does old data go out? Um, how long are you keeping the data for? You know, um, uh, you know, I work with some customers who are, uh, you know, financial payments customers where they have tons of transactions that are coming in very, very quickly. And like the last 90 days of transaction is a super interesting, but then they move off to a data warehouse after that. And so that's an example of breaking the workload up into two different um, data engines according to the needs of the application. Um, and then finally, there's, there is a certain amount of, um, you know, developer preference. I mean, it would be nice to say, you know, everybody that can take advantage of a NoSQL database should, 
and that's a nice ideal to have. But there also is a reality of a learning curve of you know what are people comfortable with, um, and we certainly don't want to uh, stymie innovation and development for a long period of time um, just because of a learning curve. So we might ease into some of these other technologies a little bit over time instead of just cutting off to it and saying no, this needs to go in a NoSQL database today because that's the right fit for the job. Um, so it's it, so it's a combination of those kinds of things. It really is. Um, there isn't really like a decision tree per se that I could put in front of you where you could kind of make every decision perfectly. There's a lot of context and a lot of situational awareness that um, needs to be taken into account when you're making the decision. Um, but but those I would say those are, are pretty high level general overview type um, concepts that people can apply to the question. How well aware do you see that customers are today about the different database services that we have? Or, or do you, as a solutions architect, introduce new services to customers when you have these, these uh, conversations? Uh, the answer is both. Um, some of the folks that I talk to um, are, are really, really knowledgeable, really know our stuff in and out. Um, in a lot of cases, they ask me questions that I don't even know the answer to, and I have to go and find the answers for them. Um, so, so a good chunk of our customers, I, I don't want to say it's 50%, but but you know maybe approaching 50%, somewhere in the 40% range perhaps, um, know the offerings pretty well and are coming to us with really informed decisions and opinions about things. Um, and then about another 40% are are kind of new and and you know sometimes they don't you know they understand NoSQL from like a I read it on Google perspective, but they don't really understand. Um, you know, the inner workings of it or, or why is NoSQL the right choice in some cases versus others. Um, and so those folks, you know, we take a little bit longer with them. We spend a little more time explaining some concepts. We we talk about, you know, the different scenarios in which one makes more sense than another. Um, particularly when making the move from SQL to NoSQL, there's a lot of education that has to happen around thinking differently about data. Um, again, you know, SQL has been around, you know, since the 70s. Um, so you've got 50 years of people thinking a certain way, um, and it's kind of easy to get pigeonholed into that thinking. And, and one of the worst things you can do is take a relational database schema and just try to shoehorn it into a NoSQL database entry, because um, you're, you're pretty much guaranteeing yourself poor performance when you do that. Um, so uh, you know, for those folks, we have to take a lot of time, not just to parse the schema, but to understand the business use case. Um, a lot of decisions about schema design were made for reasons that don't apply when you're talking about cloud technologies anymore. And so we really need to understand like, what is the business case you're actually trying to implement here and then work backwards from that instead of saying, this is how it's set up today. And then this is how it should be set up tomorrow. You know, it's, it's there's a there's a lot of nuance that gets lost in just translating the, the schema from SQL to NoSQL. And um, when we talk about NoSQL, we often talk about DynamoDB, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, as the the service of, um, that we we often choose for for instance serverless applications. Yep. Do you see that that because a service or something that we're developing is serverless that we always go to DynamoDB because of that, or do you see customers use other services as well with serverless applications today? It, it's really a mix. I mean, obviously, Dynamo is um, a really great choice if your data uh, usage patterns fit it and if your application fits it really well. Um, but uh, there are plenty of folks who are doing serverless and are still connecting to a MySQL or Postgres or, or some other relational database. Um, in fact, with the Aurora serverless offering, um, we have something called the Data API that kind of is a bridge between the two worlds. Um, one of the one of the downsides, essentially, of, of pointing a microservice directly at a traditional database engine is um, tradi traditional database engines tend to have what we would consider fairly low limits of concurrency. Um, even the beefiest Postgres server, the beefiest MySQL server can handle like eight or 10,000 concurrent connections. If you've got a, a microservice that's running that's really, really busy, it's not uncommon to see 50 or 100,000 concurrent users. And so the data API fixes that by allowing you to connect to the database and perform the same queries that you would perform over the traditional MySQL connection or the traditional Postgres connection, but you're doing it over a REST API instead of over a TCP connection. Um, and that allows you to scale your microservices out much, much further against the relational database than you would be able to um, if you were uh, connecting over a standard um, you know, SQL connection. And there's other ways to fry that fish too. You, know, you could do something like RDS proxy. Um, there's a number of third-party offerings out there that perform you know, roughly the same kind of thing. Um, but, but I think the, the short answer to your question is not really. Um, moving to microservices doesn't necessarily mean you have to move off of SQL. It's it's a pretty good path to consider. 
but I wouldn't say that it's a slam dunk for every application. Okay, I think that's a, a good answer that it depends. That's yeah. the, the answer I'm, I'm gonna, we often I'm gonna, like. I'm gonna get a shirt that just says it depends right across it so that I can just hold it up whenever people ask me those questions. We have it as a banner, so it yeah, depends. yeah. Uh, so then you touched upon Aurora now, Amazon mm -hmm. Aurora. And tell us a bit about Aurora first off. Yeah, so Aurora is basically um, Amazon's version of uh, a Postgres or MySQL database um, where we've fixed one of the, the key underlying constraints of traditional uh, databases. Um, and that is we basically rewrote the storage layer entirely. Um, so in a traditional um, MySQL or Postgres, you've got um, you know, the Postgres binary or the MySQL binary running in Linux, which is attached to um, some storage. And then you've got your database stored on that storage. And it could be an array or it could be a handful of EBS volumes or it could be something similar. But but that design is is pretty, you know, it, it's essentially universal. I mean, it's, it's the way databases have been architected again since the 70s. Um, what we did is we actually removed that storage layer so that the database engine is not actually talking to EBS directly anymore. And we've replaced it with a distributed horizontally scalable storage engine. Um, so when MySQL or Postgres goes to write a block of data, it actually writes to the storage engine. The storage engine takes care of replicating it. So you get uh, six copies of your data when you write the data to Aurora, um, two copies in each of three availability zones. Um, and then uh, we've actually changed the method in which the data is written to disk as well. So rather than keeping um, materialized views of, da of uh, database tables on disk laying around, we only store the transaction log. So we don't have to write as much data to the storage as you would um, in a traditional database system. Um, and then when the, the client goes to query data back from the database, the database engine requests the pages of data from the storage engine, and the storage engine takes care of recreating those data pages from the transaction log. Um, and this has, the, 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 this change in architecture has a huge meaningful impact on how well we're able to perform at the storage layer level. Um, for example, crash recovery in Aurora takes much less time than it takes um, if you were to do the same thing in a traditional vanilla MySQL or uh, vanilla Postgres um, installation. Um, we can do things like replicating the data between availability zones in essentially real time. We can replicate data across the globe um, using something called global database. Um, the replication lag from one side of Europe to the other with global database is less than a second. Um, and the, the replication lag isn't dependent on the types and quantity of queries that are being run, as opposed to logical replication, where if you have a transaction that takes a half an hour, your replica can fall half an hour behind the master. With physical replication in Aurora, that doesn't happen. Um, and the replication time within a single region tends to be less than 20 milliseconds, and within a geographic region like Europe, um, tends to be less than a second, couple seconds maybe. Um, if you're replicating down to Sydney, which is about as far from Europe as you can get, um, you, you're still expecting sub one minute replication latency between the primary regions in Europe and the city region. So, I mean, it, it really solves, rewriting the storage engine in the way that we have solves a lot of scaling issues with, relating, with, with relation to databases. Um, you, you don't, when you spin up an Aurora database, you don't tell us how much data you want to store. You just say, how much compute do you want? So you need to know about how much activity do you think you expect on your database to start with? And then we provision the storage um, automatically on the back end for you. And as you write more data, um, the storage expands out horizontally. It's actually being scaled to multiple storage nodes. So every 10 gigabytes of data is on a separate storage node. And as a consequence, you have, for a terabyte of data, you have at least 100 storage nodes that your data is striped across. Um, and actually it's 600 because you've got six copies of each block of data. So you've got a tremendous amount of write IO throughput and read IO throughput that you can access when you're running queries against the database. And, and as a result, the queries are much, much, much faster than they could be for, for IO bound queries. If your queries are memory bound or CPU bound, you'll still have the same problems that you would have if an open source, you know, MySQL or Postgres. But for IO bound queries, um, Aurora can really, um, you know, knock your socks off. All right, so that was five minutes of positive things about Amazon Aurora. And yep. with all that in mind then, why would someone run MySQL or PostgreSQL on RDS or on EC2 instances? Yeah, so that, that's a really excellent question. And it's again, something that we talk about a lot with customers. Um, there, there's a handful of reasons why. Um, the first thing is Aurora is a really great service and it offers lots of features, but it does it is built along a dimension involving IOPS. 
And so if you have astronomically high IOPS, um, but you don't have the budget for that, um, it sometimes makes sense to put your database back onto RDS or even onto an EC2 instance because you have much finer grain control over IO um, on EC2 than, and on RDS than you do with Aurora. Um, Aurora is also designed for massively parallel operations. If you have a database engine that principally serves like a batch job that runs once a night or a couple times a day, it's mostly single threaded. The concurrency is you know, perhaps measured in single digits or maybe low double digits. Um, you actually can sometimes get better performance out of an RDS MySQL or RDS Postgres instance than you can out of the equivalent Aurora uh, MySQL or Postgres instance. So it depends a little bit on that. Um, there are some cases, for, so as far as EC2 is concerned, people would choose EC2 for a couple of different reasons, most of which re revolves around using third-party plugins or needing to tune stuff that is um, part of the managed service. So if you're, if, you're, if you're creating a lot of UDFs, if you're installing a lot of third-party plugins, if you're really tuning um, specific InnoDB parameters and that sort of thing, you may still want to run it on EC2. Um, another use case that I've seen, and this is kind of rare to be honest with you, but I'll, I'll mention it just because it's worth people keeping in mind, is if you have a relatively small data set, but that has super, super, super high IOs, um, on an EC2 instance, you could actually load that into a RAM disk and just have the database engine load and access the data as though it were a mechanical drive or an SSD, but from RAM, um, which essentially eliminates IOs for that data set because everything is happening in memory, so there is no disk IO. Um, and also makes the access times very, very, very low um, because there is there is no storage medium involved in that point. Again, it's a it's a limited use case. I don't see it very often, but I have seen it deployed a couple of times um, where people have a, a, like a relatively static data set um, that is just being read like, you know, at an enormous volume. Um, that That's another use case for EC2 as well. It does, you know, it, it comes, you know, I, the, the more you move from the Aurora side of the spectrum to the EC2 spectrum, you know, that also is a, a measurement of how much work you have to do as a database administrator. Yeah. Um, when you're deploying on EC2, you're responsible for everything. When you're deploying an RCS, uh, sorry, RDS, um, you need to pick a couple of options, but most of the stuff is handled in the backend for you. Um, and when you're deploying on Aurora, basically you say, I want a database, and we more or less take care of everything else on the backend for you. So from... Uh... Um, I know this, um, I don't like this word, but from a lock-in perspective then, <laughs> if you start off with Aurora, are you locked into Aurora then? Or what are the migration paths if you want to move to RDS or to EC2? Yeah, so Aurora supports um, a number of different ways to get data in or out. One of the things that I really like to tell customers, especially new folks that I'm talking to for the first time is, I want you to be our customer because you want to be our customer, not because it's hard to get your data out. Um, and so along those lines, um, RDS Aurora and RDS, sorry, Aurora MySQL and Aurora Postgres, um, because they are mostly vanilla Postgres and mostly vanilla MySQL to the extent that we can make them, you can use all the same data import and export tools in them that you could on a self-managed instance. So you've got access to things like MySQL dump, you've got access to PG dump for Postgres, um, you've got access to inbound and outbound logical replication. So if you have um, a, a database running on-prem and you want to replicate your data from Aurora to it in real time, you can do that over the standard logical replication channel. You can go the other way. So you can replicate your data in from on-prem into a cloud database, and then maybe your application hits the cloud copy while the, the actual writing happens on-prem or something like that. Um, and you can replicate basically to anywhere that you have a network path. So if you've got MySQL running anywhere else on the internet, as long as you can make a TCP connection between um, AWS and that other database, you can replicate data between them. Um, and we have actually got, in addition to the standard MySQL tools and Postgres tools, and in addition to standard logical replication, we've also got the schema conversion tool, and we've got the database migration service, which takes care of moving data in and out of a number of different database engines, um, and Aurora is just one of them. So you can go in and out of Aurora, you can go from Oracle, uh, on-prem to Aurora MySQL or Aurora Postgres on AWS. You can go from Aurora MySQL on AWS back out to you know, Oracle if you decide you don't want to stay on AWS or something like that. Um, so there's a number of different ways to get the data to go in, in either direction. That's great. All right, so if you just joined us, welcome to the AWS Nordics office hours. Uh, my name is Gunnar Grosch, and this week I have Tim Gustafsson on. He's a specialist solutions architect for databases, and that is the topic for this week. We're talking databases on AWS.
And this session is recorded, so you'll be able to watch it afterwards because there is a lot of information about databases in this session. So go back, watch it once again if you wish. So if you have any questions for Tim, um, just put them in the chat and we'll do our best or he'll do his best to, to answer it. I'll just nod and look like I know <laughs> what he's talking about. Uh, so Tim, yeah, we've talked about Aurora now. Um, mm -hmm. And I, as a fan of serverless, I know that we also have Aurora serverless. Yep. And at reInvent, uh, we launched V2, version 2 yep. of Aurora serverless. Yep. Can you tell us yeah. uh, a, a little bit about the difference? What happened with V2? Compared yeah, to let me let me start by saying Aurora Serverless has actually been my favorite AWS feature since before I was even a database specialist. Um, I, I think it very nicely solves a problem for nerds like me and for other folks who are trying to use databases in a kind of a serverless way, um, because it it fixes one one of the principal problems with databases and and particularly with SQL databases we're talking about now. So ignoring NoSQL for a minute, because NoSQL kind of has the scaling problem solved to a certain extent. Um, but scaling traditional RDS uh, or relational databases um, has always been kind of challenging because you, you, there, there always basically has to be an instance somewhere that is the leader and that is responsible for arbitrating transactions and for deciding who wins in the case of a conflict and that kind of stuff. And, and scaling that's always been really challenging. Um, historically, it's, if you need to scale up your primary, it generally requires a reboot. Um, which could mean you know several minutes of downtime for an application, or it could mean failing over to a replica while you reboot the primary. I mean, it's it's not it works, and we've got a lot of tooling around it that makes it less painful than it used to be, but it's it's still not ideal. So Aurora Serverless V1 fixed some of that problem by giving us a MySQL database engine that um, and now Postgres also that allows you to scale up and scale down the compute portion of your database engine without affecting the storage. And it does this based on a couple of different metrics. Um, for Aurora Serverless V1, it's, it's principally CPU consumption and number of concurrent connections. And so when either of those two metrics exceeded a certain threshold, um, the uh, database engine would automatically scale up to meet the demand for the new um, requests that are coming in. And so with Aurora Serverless V1, this worked pretty well. But there was a scaling event that took place when you were scaling up or scaling down. It was around 20 seconds or so. Um, and it caused some trouble for some applications because the, the, the clients would experience this latency and this lag and, and, and that kind of stuff when it was doing scaling, which wasn't, wasn't super great. But it, I mean, it's better than the alternative, but it wasn't perfect, right? Um, and then there's a few other limitations with V1 that made it hard to recommend it for really high-end um, production workloads, things like there was no such thing as high availability. So with Aurora Serverless V1, if your master crashed for some reason, you have to wait for a new uh, you know, new primary to come online. Um, there's no uh, quick failover to a replica because there's no replicas with Aurora Serverless V1. Um, things like cloning and replication and uh, you know a number of other features just aren't available in the V1 offering. V2 aims to fix all of that. The, the goal for V2 is basically to be on feature parity with provisioned Aurora. So if it's supported in provisioned Aurora, the plan is that it will also be supported in uh, serverless Aurora V2. So replicas will work, global database will work, RDS proxy will work, all of the other stuff that people have been waiting for and, and that V1 hasn't supported um, will become available with the V2 offering. That's, that's the plan. Um, as well as the, the features that were serverless specific before um, are, are planned to be available with the V2 offering as well. So things like the data API um, should be available for V2 as well. So it really kind of makes it hard to recommend provisioned Aurora anymore. Um, because at a certain point, you know, when if you zoom out a little bit for any database deployed anywhere in the world, almost every one of them has variable load, right? You know, you're you're going to be busy Monday Monday to Friday nine to five. Let's say if you're if you've got an application that is facing um, other businesses and other sort of weekday consumers, um, if you're running, you know, uh, you know something that supports sporting events, then evenings are likely to be busy for you. But like the, you know, there's, there's going to be periods of days when you're really high, and then there's going to be periods of days when your usage is really low. And you're wasting a lot of money provisioning a database instance for that high demand that's sitting idle nights and weekends, let's say. Um, serverless fixes that. Um, it allows you to scale up and scale down according to that demand. You can actually define your own metrics. So where with V1, the, the two metrics that it used were CPU consumption and number of connections. Um, with V2, you can actually define your own metrics. So if you know 
that you need a replica for every thousand concurrent users, um, you can scale up according to that. You can scale out replicas according to that, or you can scale up the primary according to what your requirements are. Um, so there's there's a lot of uh, Im improvements along those lines. Um, one other thing that's I think worth mentioning is that with uh, serverless v1, um, your capacity doubled at every step. So you went from one to two to four to eight to 16, all the way up to 256. Um, with v2, it actually is a much finer scaling increment. So you're not doubling your capacity just because you're 10% over your threshold. Um, you can add just enough to accept the 10% extra work. Um, and you're not, again, kind of over provisioning in a serverless way. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of improvements around those kinds of things. As I said, it's gonna be really hard for me to recommend provisioned Aurora to folks once serverless v2 comes out. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to think of use cases where it would be really appropriate to do so. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting to hear. Um move into serverless as a way to 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 always adjust for that variable load that's that yeah. as you said all workloads have they have yeah. a variable load somehow. Yeah. somehow so we have a question uh from raging hamster any mm -hmm. secret tips to avoid surprise billing based on scaling um, for example based yeah. on scheduled scaling and so on yeah, with serverless, um, so changes to the serverless configuration can all be made through the control plane API, um, which is the SDK basically. So if you know that you're gonna have a busy time, you can build a Lambda function or something somewhere that calls the data plane API to change the minimum and maximum scaling parameters for that window of time. Um, so if you know, you know, if, if your nights and weekends traffic is such that you are perfectly willing to let things take a bit longer, you can set the maximum scaling window nights and weekends to whatever value you want to one, let's say, um, to make sure that the load, you know, that the um, uh, the capacity never goes above that, regardless of load. Um, and then you can you can set them to more, you know, um, uh, generous uh, proportions during business hours when you're expecting the load to be um, higher and are willing to incur that cost. Oh, that's great. Uh, next question then: Can Aurora MySQL be added to X-Ray for tracing? So, if you use the the uh, data API, I believe the answer is yes. Although I would have to double check that for you. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I believe the uh, data API um, is does support X-Ray. I think if you still go over the um, uh, traditional MySQL or traditional uh, Postgres uh, TCP connections. I don't think there's a way to, to instrument that with X-Ray because those protocols are defined by those vendors, by, you know, by the open source projects. Um, and I don't think we can add annotations to them that um, the X-Ray daemon would pick up on the other side to be able to add them to the traces. Right. Uh, more generic question from Alex, hey Tim, what was your biggest challenge you remember, database related? Like in my career <laughs> challenge? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned kind of earlier in the call, I was a developer for um, for a very long time, 20 years almost before I came to AWS. And I actually had developed a, um, a content management system for a small IT company in New York um, where I, when I lived back out there. Um, and I made a very poor architectural decision at the time because you know this was this was 1998 or 99 I think um, and so you know cloud didn't exist all the stuff that we're talking about today was just a pipe dream um, and so we built a, a CMS that basically used a single database engine for all of its tenants um, and that database grew to like the 60 70 80 um, gigabyte size which doesn't sound like a lot of data today but in 1998 it was. Um, <laughs> And moving that much data around became super challenging. So the the, um, the takeaway that I've always kind of learned since then uh, was don't don't put all your data in one database, especially multi-tenant databases. Um, you know, spread them across different data, even if they're in the same database engine, put them in different schemas um, so that you can you can treat them all individually from one another. Because uh, yeah, that much data at the time was really problematic. The same thing is basically true today. Um, I'm not sure. It, for, given the kind of scalability and the, the serverless nature of a lot of the stuff we're talking about today, there's really not a lot of incentive to put more than one um, application into a single database instance. There, there are some caveats here. If, if you've got a bunch of microservices that are all really low throughput, um, it's probably okay to put them into a multi-tenant hotel type database engine. But for your primary facing microservices, put them all into separate databases as much as possible. Um, so that you're you're limiting the blast radius around maintaining that much data because once you start getting up into terabytes, uh, 
You know, Aurora supports, I think, up to 128 terabytes of data right now, which is great. But if you have to restore 128 terabytes of data or if you have to transfer it somewhere else, it's going to take a long time. Um, so think about, uh, you know, breaking things up into smaller chunks um, that are more manageable. And I actually think that that's actually good advice for basically anything cloud related. You know, break up the monoliths into smaller chunks so that they can be managed a little bit more easily. Um, you know, even with multi-megabit, multi-gigabit, uh, uh, you know, internet connections in our houses and things like that, it still um, it still takes a while to transfer data sometimes, and and breaking it up into small chunks helps. I, I remember that I forget who said it, but there was some uh, funny statement from back in the day where um, that you should never underestimate the bandwidth of a, a truck full of hard disks driving down the freeway, um, and that's that's still even true today. And we have service offerings built around that Snowball and and uh, uh, um, um, Oh my God! Why am I forgetting the name of the one? There's, there's snowmobile. Thank you. I gotta have my SA license taken away now. Um, yeah, snowball and snowmobile are are basically the physical manifestations of that funny quote, which is that it is still often faster to tra to to put data into a car and drive it somewhere um, than it is to transfer it over the internet. Yeah. So um, we've talked about several different um, types of databases and database services. Now, can we talk a bit about? Uh, in the memory databases? Yeah, absolutely. So what are the offerings that, that AWS have right now uh, in regards to in memory databases? So ElastiCache uh, currently supports Memcached and also Redis. Um, Memcached, I think, is, is older and, and um, a bit simpler. Um, it, it's a little bit less featureful than Redis, um, but it still, is a, you know, it, it still is a valid option. Redis adds a couple of nice features though, that a lot of people find attractive. Um, Redis can actually store its state to disk so that when you boot it back up again, you're not starting with a clean cache. Um, it supports replication. I, I think, uh, so I'm not I'm not uh, fully up on the, the in-memory database right now, but I believe I remember seeing recently a, um, a note that we support cross-region replication with Redis now, if I remember correctly. I wouldn't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that I saw that come out. So there's stuff that you can do with Redis that um, is more challenging to do with memcache, um, you know, multi-node clusters, that kind of stuff. Um, Caching stuff in memory is, is absolutely a valid and, and very useful paradigm, um, especially if you have stuff that's being accessed. Again, the you know, velocity is very, very high, and the cost of computing the um, answer to the question is very high. Um, so if, if you can construct an application in a way that it can deal with that kind of cached data instead of hitting the raw database every time, absolutely go for it. Um, Redis and Memcache are the, the sort of roll your own, do it yourself caching options. Um, we also have uh, time, uh, time stream I talked about before has an in-memory component. Um, and so does, uh, you know, we, we have the DAX offering as well, the, the DynamoDB Accelerator, um, which does some of the same kind of acceleration in front of a DynamoDB NoSQL database. Um, and, and that kind of serves the same purpose, basically to reduce the latency it takes to retrieve data from, um, in, in that case, the NoSQL database engine. Do you see the same uh, type of questions there as well in regards to using it as uh, a managed service like Elasticash or running it in your own instances? To to a lesser extent, there because the database engines themselves are a bit a bit simpler. Um, there, are, I mean, frankly, there's fewer configuration options, and so there's less people. There's less that people really want to do with them. Um, I, I think you know. With either Redis or Memcache, basically what you're asking for is a large chunk of memory that is network accessible. And both of those database engines support that. They both support the key value lookup kind of uh, paradigm. Um, there is there is some tunability to them, but for the most part, I think people know how to use them. They're, they're pretty straightforward. Um, there, there's, there, are much, there are many fewer questions, I feel like, around uh, in-memory database caches like those than there are around the, the relational engines and also in Dynamo and the other NoSQL ones. Yeah. So then um, what questions I see quite a lot today uh, when building applications is talk about the global application. We're talking about global scale. And, and this really applies and, and perhaps brings a lot of questions to mind as well in regards to databases. So yeah. if we want to go glo global with our application, uh, and then, of course, we need to use some sort of data store, some database. Yeah. What what are the options uh, in regards to global databases? So there's principally two managed options from AWS that I think are worth knowing about here. The first one is that Aurora supports global database, um, and global database in Aurora is a single primary writer region and up to five replica regions, and these regions could be any of the AWS uh, regions that support it. 
Um, and so you can wind up basically with six copies of your database distributed globally around the world. Um, uh, global database for MySQL also supports uh, something called write forwarding. So the application's running in the individual region. So let, let's say your primary is in Dublin again, and let's say your replica is running in Sydney. Um, an application running in Sydney, when it wants to update the database, connects to the Sydney endpoint and sends an insert statement or an update statement. And the Aurora database engine takes care of forwarding that back to Dublin. Dublin does the actual work of committing it to disk, makes sure that the data is uh, durably stored, and then responds back to Sydney and says, okay, you're done, go ahead and move on. Um, and that gives you this really global, globally scalable database. Uh, and this is still a relational database, so you get all the joining and the, all the stuff that you would expect with a traditional relational database. The replication lag is, is essentially tied to uh, speed of light. Um, uh, you know, again, for cross um, uh, Europe, you know, it's measured in milliseconds, maybe double digit number of milliseconds, perhaps 100 milliseconds. Um, when you're replicating down to Sydney, it, it could be longer than that because just the, of the, the distance involved and the speed of light. Um, but, but it's actually pretty acceptable replication. Um, and because of the way physical replication works in Aurora, um, it's not tied to a serial application of the replay of the redo log. Um, so even if you have really high concurrency on your primary, the global replicas are really able to keep up. Um, the, I have a graph that I share when I do a, a deep dive on Aurora that shows what their, their write latency is like or the replication latency is like for uh, different transaction volumes. With logical replication, you get around 30,000, 40,000 transactions per second. And then the transaction, uh, the, the replication latency starts to go way up. Um, you get as high as a couple of hundred seconds um, of replication lag. With the physical replication in Aurora, you can get up to 200,000 queries per second, and the replication lag stays around 0 0.5 seconds, so around 500 milliseconds. So, I mean, the, the global replica in uh, Aurora is super cool, super good technology, and really, really, really fits that use case for applications that are using a relational database. Um, for applications that are not using a relational database, DynamoDB also supports something called global tables. And so when you create a table in DynamoDB, you set it up as a global table. Again, let's say we're going from uh, Dublin to Sydney. So you create the table in Dublin, you create the global table in Sydney, and the DynamoDB engine takes care of replicating data between the two of them. Um, the difference with Dynamo global tables is that you can actually um, write to either endpoint directly, and the DynamoDB engine takes care of replicating the data to the other region. So there isn't this there isn't this latency to go back to the primary and then come back to Sydney again. Um, it actually can happen in region. And then there's a, a right conflict resolution protocol that happens on the back end that, that handles situations where two um, uh, databases update the transaction in short succession. So what are the considerations to for when to choose to go global with your database and, and not? So um... I mean, it, it depends on what your application is doing. I mean, if, if you're building an application where people are, you know, let's say placing orders and checking the status of their orders, uh, global databases make a lot of sense. Um, they bring the data close to the users. The, the kinds of concurrency that you see in those sorts of applications is low enough that there's very little chance of a person uh, stepping on somebody else's foot when they're when they're updating a record. And so, I mean, it works it works really well. Um, it's it's probably worth the um, the replication, you know, the, the hit that you get for going those distances. Um, I, one thing I didn't mention is replication lag with Aurora Global Database is mostly related to speed of light. So the speed of light from Dublin to Sydney and back again. And remember the TCP packet takes a couple of round trips. Um, so I think the latency from, from Sydney to um, Dublin is like 80 milliseconds uh, just by speed of light. But because of TCP, it's more like 320 milliseconds because there's a couple of packets back and forth. And then if you stack that, you know, a single TCP packet can only be so large. So if you're updating a megabyte of data, like there's a bunch of packets that get sent back and forth and, and the replication latency can, or rather the transaction latency can go up a little bit for that. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for most for most applications, I think it, it makes total sense and there's no reason to not do it. The only situation where I think it probably makes better sense to use a single master as, as in Aurora Global Database does, as opposed to DynamoDB, is when you're dealing with things like financial transactions where you're taking money from one person's account and putting it into another, you really want to make sure that you've got the right consistency there. You really want, like, the the, the conflict arbitration protocol for DynamoDB makes that kind of transaction a little bit more challenging um, because you need to make sure that when you transfer money from my account to your account that I don't simultaneously create another transaction in Sydney 
that transfers money from my account to a third party's account um, because now I've double spent my money. So that that kind of stuff um, for those kinds of uh, situations where you really want super high level of assurance over the, the correctness of the data, um, it, it probably still makes sense to have a single writer. But for most other things, I mean, the DynamoDB global tables works really, really well. Um, it's really great at keeping the data in sync across different regions. It, it's really an acceptable level of latency for most applications. So um, then talking about Aurora again, uh, as, mm -hmm. as a person who's uh, multiple times set up MySQL replication in, in the past, I know the ease of using Aurora instead for, yeah. for having global databases. Um, but what about multi-master configuration? So there isn't currently an official multi-master offering for, especially for cross-region for um, Aurora at this point, it's all based on the right forwarding technology, which is a very close approximation to multi-master. Um, but the difference is that with right forwarding, you're still dependent on your primary region. So if your primary region goes offline for some reason, um, writes will stop until either the primary region comes back online or you promote one of your other regions to be the new primary. Um, and you can do that, generally speaking, in about a minute. Once you detect that there's been a failure and you realize you want to cut over to another region as the primary, um, you can do that pretty quickly, um, about a minute or less, depending on uh, a couple of different factors. Um, uh, there is a multi-master for within a single region with MySQL. Um, I, I think that that... I know that there are definitely use cases for it, um, but I think that people who are looking for multi-master, it's also worth having a conversation about what they're trying to accomplish with having a multi-master because it does complicate things. Um, and it raises a, a couple of other questions where, like I would want to understand why, like what is what is the requirement to have multi-master and, and what, what problem are you trying to solve um, uh, before we actually really implement it? Because it is more complicated. Um, things can break a little bit with it. If, you, if you've got conflicts, it can cause problems for you. Um, so again, you know, I, it, it's supported. There's a feature for it. By all means, go ahead and use it. I would just make sure that you have a, an architecture conversation around the appropriate appropriateness for it um, in in a given solution. Yeah, I think that's that's sound advice for for many pieces of our architecture to have a discussion yeah. with with subject matter experts. And and that brings me on to my usual tip of the week that. You, as a viewer, you're able to schedule one-on-one -on -one sessions with AWS experts. I sent a link to the chat right now, and you're able to schedule a session to, to talk with a solution architect about your use case, what you're trying to build. So, so make use of that. Yeah. Um, another, well, a part of most applications that we build is the ability to, to search within the application. And mm -hmm. we have... Um, of course, you're able to search within most of the databases, but we mm -hmm. also have a, a service for that, Elasticsearch. Yep. Mm -hmm. How do you see, where do we position Elast Elasticsearch in, in uh, this map of databases and data stores? So ironically, Elasticsearch is actually, I think, counted in the analytics uh, group at this point. So, so strictly speaking, it's not part of my team, but, um, but I can talk a little bit about it. Um, it definitely, uh, you know, it is a very standard part of applications. Elasticsearch provides a bunch of search functionality that is absent from basically all of the other databases. Um, and it's not its not really so much a database technology thing as a, a kind of language processing and analytics thing. Um, Elasticsearch does some stuff with the data that other database engines just don't do. Um, things like stemming, which I, I don't know how much you know about this stuff, but if you take, um, let's say the word rain, and you want to search for the word rain in a, in a database, you also want to search for, even though you don't ask for it, you want the database to search for rainy, rains, raining. Um, and the Elasticsearch uh, application takes care of that for you. It, it, it's, it's a process called stemming, where it actually searches for the stem of the word and then searches on that and indexes on that instead of, of the literal word that you put into the search box. Um, and that's not, I mean, Postgres has some full text indexing that does that to a certain extent. MySQL has full text indexing, but it doesn't do stemming right now. Um, I think there is a, or there was anyway, at the when I worked on it a couple of years ago, um, there was an effort to put forward the ability to have a stemming plugin loaded into MySQL. Um, but last I checked, it wasn't even there. So if you want the, the kind of fluid search that most users are looking for, you probably want to use something like Elasticsearch because that's, that's the level of uh, search competence that your users are going to be looking for. 
um, even without knowing what they're asking for, they're, they're gonna want stemming, they're gonna want the ability to do correlation mm -hmm. of bigrams and trigrams and all the other kind of stuff where it's not just a word that I'm searching for, but it's two words and their adjacency within the text makes them score higher than if they're in two different parts of the text, that kind of stuff. Um, and Elasticsearch takes care of all of that for you. The other databases, you can do it. I mean, there, there are plenty of people that use MySQL's built-in search and uh, you know, full-text indexing. There are plenty of people that use Postgres's uh, built-in full-text indexing, and they work well enough. But if you really want the polished, super responsive, super user-friendly search engines, you're going to want to go with something like Elasticsearch um, because of that functionality that it gives you. That's great. So, so Elasticsearch isn't part of the, of the data source or databases anymore. Uh, no, it's in analytics because it's used for a lot of analytics type stuff. If you think about like Grafana yeah. and all those kinds of things that access Elasticsearch, um, that actually is one of the primary use cases. It is good as a text uh, search engine though. Uh, so that, that use case is still there. Yeah, makes sense. Right, so you touched on graph databases early on. Uh, yeah. So can we, just talk a bit about the graph databases again, because that's absolutely um, it's an interesting topic, one that isn't talked enough about, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, so Amazon Neptune is yep. our graph offering. Yep. So what is Neptune? So Neptune is a graph database engine that actually supports two different protocols. Um, it supports uh, Gremlin and it supports um, uh, Sparkle. So there, these are actually two different uh, query languages that uh, that actually in the Neptune engine are actually stored currently as two different data sets. Um, and which one of them you choose, one of them, you know, the RDF based one, RDF stands for Resource, Resource Description Framework, um, is kind of an older and more formal um, way to define the relationships between different things. Um, and uh, um, uh, my brain is failing me now. Uh, the, the, the newer one allows you to actually just kind of make ad hoc connections between things and it's, it's more, I, I, I feel like the newer one is more applicable to um, what most people are doing these days. Basically, the idea is this. You, you have two nodes, and you've got paths between them. And the paths are one-way relationships. So uh, Tim is friends with Gunnar, but Gunnar is maybe not necessarily friends with Tim. If Gunnar wants to be friends with Tim, you create another relationship that points back the other way. You create these relationships not just between you know, different people, but maybe Tim likes SQL, and Gunnar likes SQL. So by you can search across these multiple dimensions to find the relationships between different people. The, you know, this is nothing new in terms of like a, a data science experiment, but what happens differently with graph databases is that they're optimizing the way the data is stored differently. And so queries that connect between different relationships and different commonalities between nodes um, are more performant and it's able to handle like billions of nodes and billions of connections between them um, in a much more uh, efficient way than you would see if you did this the same kind of schema in SQL. Um, it's useful for like lots of, I mean, social media is the example that everybody gives because it's something that people can digest pretty easily. Um, but graph databases are used in things like fraud detection um, for you know credit card transactions and that kind of stuff. They're used in things like recommendation engines. So if you buy something on a website, the recommending something else that you might like um, sometimes happens through a graph database. Um, so there's there's a number of different use cases that are other than social media um, that allow you to to take advantage of this kind of data structure. Um, it is a different way of thinking about data, um, and so you you need to build your schema again in in the same way that there's a jump to go from SQL to NoSQL. Um, there is also a jump to go from SQL or NoSQL to graph. Um, you need to think about your data in, in kind of a different way. Um, yeah, thanks for the graph guide there uh, in the chat. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it can solve a lot of problems for applications, particularly when you have tons and tons and tons of nodes and tons and tons and tons of relationships between them. Um, it Again, as I said before, with the difference between SQL and NoSQL, I, I don't think Neptune is going to supplant the other database engines anytime soon. It's not designed to replace and do the things that the other database engines are doing already. It's a different paradigm. And just like you might wind up with an application that uses both SQL and NoSQL databases to achieve its purpose, um, you'll often find Neptune thrown in there as a third database option to store the parts of the data that that benefit from that kind of organization. Hmm. Yeah, and and building the same type of relations with with a relational database um, that would mean that we need more more instances, perhaps, or more power to be able to do it. 
Per, perhaps. I mean, it, it, but it's but it's actually more um, insidious than that because it, it's not so much the data engineering as it is the query complexity. Um, when you if you think about the way um, you know uh, queries work in SQL, you know, imagine a scenario where it's you know Tim and Gunnar and uh, let's say Johan, right? For me to relate from me to you directly is a fairly straightforward SQL query. You know, select star from relationships where the source is Tim and the subject is SQL and you get back a list of everybody, including Gunnar, right? It's when you start to jump to multiple generations out in the graph database that it gets more complicated because then using traditional SQL, I have to run that query a second time to get all of the links that you have and a third time to get all the links that they have and so on and so forth out to the edge of the graph. Um, with the graph database, it optimizes that so that when you're writing your query, first of all, you don't have to write a recursive kind of thing like that. You just say, give me all of the relationships to Tim who are interested in SQL and go out four layers. Like you actually specify how many layers out you want to go and the engine takes care of building that and querying that for you. Um, whereas if you did that in SQL, it would be a lot more code. It would be a lot more round trips between your application and the database engine. So not only is it consuming more IO on the database engine, but it's keeping your application server busier and it's creating a lot of additional traffic between the two of them because of all the work that you're having to do. Um, so, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's a very, it, it's a very different way of thinking about stuff, but it's definitely worth it uh, to engineer your data that way if you have those kinds of questions that you're trying to answer with your data. Yeah, so once again, depending on the use case, uh, this fits a specific purpose built for, for that type of relationships, questions, uh, or yep. queries. Yeah. But we have a very specific question as well. Sorry, that one, there we go. So I have a single region Aurora cluster and I need to enable TLS. Is there a way to do it without downtime? Uh, so by TLS, I assume you mean TLS on the MySQL uh, TCP connection uh, protocol. Um, there is a parameter group setting for that. I think that is a dynamic parameter group setting, but you need to have your, your database already connected to a non-default parameter group to change that. Um, so let me let me explain what I mean by that. When you, when you spin up a new Aurora instance or any new RDS instance, you choose a parameter group and there is a default, but the default is read only, so you can't make changes to it. Um, if you haven't selected a custom parameter group when you spun up the Aurora cluster, you will need to create a new parameter group and associate it with the cluster before you're able to change the parameter. And that requires a maintenance window uh, style reboot. So you, you can't attach a new parameter group to a running uh, Aurora instance. You need to have it attached at boot in order for it to recognize it. Once you have that, all of the parameters in the parameter group that are labeled as, I, I think it's called dynamic on the, the UI, um, you can change while the server is running without having to reboot it. So the answer to your question is, if you booted your Aurora instance with a default parameter group, then you're going to need to do at least one reboot to pick up a new custom parameter group. Once you've done that, this and other changes similar to it um, become things that you can do without having to reboot in the future. All right, great answer. So we are approaching top of the hour, which means it's time to say goodbye to Tim and goodbye to, to you, all the viewers. So thank you very much for being here this week, Tim, and talking about all things uh, databases on AWS. My pleasure. Covered quite a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. So, I know, Tim, you're not on Twitter, but uh, if people want to reach you somehow, um, is LinkedIn a choice or do you run your own social network in uh, Neptune, perhaps? No, LinkedIn is probably the best way. You, you can find me on there pretty easily. And uh, that, yeah, I'm, I'm not a social media person, but uh, but feel free to reach out on LinkedIn if that's interesting. And I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions that way. Yeah, and notice that he is missing one of the S uh, in his last name because Chris Tim is. Is, is not Gustavsson. He's Gustavsson. Uh, all yeah. right. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to me as well, and I'll make sure to forward it to Tim. Absolutely. Thanks, yep. everyone. And have a good day ahead and hopefully see you again next week. Yep.